Part two, chapter seventeen of the Fur Country. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Fur Country by Jules Verne, chapter seventeen. The Avalanche. The colonists were then at last approaching the more frequented latitudes of Bering Sea. There was no longer any danger that they would be drifted to the north and all they had to do was to watch the displacement of the island and to estimate the speed of its motion which would probably be very unequal on account of the obstacles in its path hobson most carefully noted every incident taking alternately solar and stellar altitudes and the next day april sixteenth after ascertaining the bearings he calculated that if its present speed were maintained victoria island would reach the arctic circle from which it was now separated at the most by four degrees of latitude towards the beginning of may it was probable that when the island reached the narrowest portion of the strait it would remain stationary until the thaw broke it up the boat would then be launched and the colonists would set sail for the american continent everything was ready for an immediate embarkation and the inhabitants of the island waited with greater patience and confidence than ever they felt poor things that the end of their trials was surely near at last and that nothing could prevent their landing on one side or the other of the strait in a few days this prospect cheered them up wonderfully and the gaiety natural to them all which they had lost in the terrible anxiety they had so long endured was restored the common meals were quite festal as there was no need for economizing the stores under present circumstances the influence of the spring became more and more sensibly felt and every one enjoyed the balmy air and breathed more freely than before during the next few days several excursions were made to the interior of the island and along the coast everywhere the furred animals etc still abounded for even now they could not cross to the continent the connection between it and the ice-field being broken and their continued presence was a fresh proof that the island was no longer stationary no change had taken place on the island at cape eskimo cape michael along the coast or on the wooded heights of the interior and the banks of the lagoon the large gulf which had opened near cape michael during the storm had closed in the winter and there was no other fissure on the surface of the soil during these excursions bands of wolves were seen scudding across parts of the island of all the animals, these fierce, carnivorous beasts were the only ones which the feeling of a common danger had not tamed. Kalumaha's preserver was seen several times. This worthy bear paced to and fro on the deserted plains in melancholy mood, pausing in his walks as the explorers passed, and sometimes following them to the fort, knowing well that he had nothing to fear from them. On the 20th April, Lieutenant Hobson ascertained that the wandering island was still drifting to the south. All that remained of the ice wall, that is to say, the southern portion of the icebergs, followed it. But as there were no benchmarks, the changes of position could only be estimated by astronomical observations. Hobson took several soundings in different parts of the ground, especially at the foot of Cape Bathurst and on the shores of the lagoon. He was anxious to ascertain the thickness of the layer of ice supporting the earth and sand, and found that it had not increased during the winter, and that the general level of the island did not appear to have risen higher above that of the sea. The conclusion he drew from these facts was that no time should be lost in getting away from the fragile island, which would rapidly break up and dissolve in the warmer waters of the Pacific. About the 25th April, the bearing of the island was again changed. The whole ice-field had moved round, from east to west, twelve points, so that Cape Bathurst pointed to the northwest. The remains of the ice-wall now shut in the northern horizon, so that there could be no doubt that the ice-field was moving freely in the strait, and that it nowhere touched any land. The fatal moment was approaching. Diurnal or nocturnal observations gave the exact position of the island, and consequently of the ice-field. On the 30th of April, both were together drifting across Kutsubi Sound, 
a large triangular gulf running some distance inland on the American coast, and bounded on the south by Cape Prince of Wales, which might perhaps arrest the course of the island if it should deviate in the very least from the middle of the narrow pass. The weather was now pretty fine, and the column of mercury often marked fifty degrees Fahrenheit. The colonists had left off their winter garments some weeks before, and held themselves in constant readiness to leave the island. Thomas Black had already transported his instruments and books to the boat, which was waiting on the beach. A good many provisions had also been embarked, and some of the most valuable furs. On the 2nd of May, a very carefully taken observation showed that Victoria Island had a tendency to drift towards the east, and consequently to reach the American continent. This was fortunate, as they were now out of danger of being taken any further by the Kamchatka Current, which, as is well known, runs along the coast of Asia. At last the tide was turning in favour of the colonists. "'I think our bad fortune is at last at an end,' observed Sergeant Long to Mrs. Barnett, "'and that our misfortunes are really over. I don't suppose there are any more dangers to be feared now.' "'I quite agree with you,' replied Mrs. Barnett, "'and it is very fortunate that we have to give up our journey across the ice-field a few months ago. We ought to be very thankful that it was impassable.' Mrs. Barnett was certainly justified in speaking as she did, for what fearful fatigues and sufferings they would all have had to undergo in crossing five hundred miles of ice in the darkness of the polar night. On the 5th May, Hobson announced that Victoria Island had just crossed the Arctic Circle. It had at last re-entered that zone of the terrestrial sphere in which at one period of the year the sun does not set. The poor people all felt that they were returning to the inhabited globe. The event of crossing the Arctic Circle was celebrated in much the same way as crossing the equator for the first time would be on board ship, and many glasses of spirits was drank in honour of the event. There was now nothing left to do but to wait till the broken and half-melted ice should allow of the passage of the boat, which was to bear the whole colony to the land. During the 7th May, the island turned round to the extent of another quarter of its circumference. Cape Bathurst now pointed due north, and those masses of the old chain of icebergs, which still remained standing, were now above it, so that it occupied much of the same position as that assigned to it in maps when it was united to the American continent. The island gradually turned completely round, and the sun had risen successively on every point of its shores. The observations of the 8th May showed that the island had become stationary near the middle of the passage, at least forty miles from Cape Prince of Wales, so that land was now at a comparatively short distance from it, and the safety of all seemed to be secured. In the evening a good supper was served in the large room, and the health of Mrs. Barnett and of Lieutenant Hobson were proposed. The same night the lieutenant determined to go and see if any changes had taken place in the ice-field on the south, hoping that a practicable passage might have been opened. Mrs. Barnett was anxious to accompany him, but he persuaded her to rest a little instead, and started off, accompanied only by Sergeant Long. Mrs. Barnett, Madge, and Kalumah returned to the principal house after seeing them off, and the soldiers and women had already gone to bed in the different apartments assigned to them. It was a fine night, there was no moon, but the stars shone very brightly, and as the ice-field vividly reflected their light, it was possible to see for a considerable distance. It was nine o'clock when the two explorers left the fort, and turned towards that part of the coast between Port Barnett and Cape Michael. They followed the beach for about two miles, and found the ice-field in a state of positive chaos. The sea was one vast aggregation of crystals of every size. It looked as if it had been petrified suddenly when tossing in a tempest, and, alas, there was even now no free passage between the ice-masses. It would be impossible for a boat to pass yet. Hobson and Long remained on the ice-field, talking and looking about them until midnight, and then seeing that there was still nothing to do but wait, 
they decided to go back to Fort Hope and rest for a few hours. They had gone some hundred paces and had reached the dried-up bed of Paulina River when an unexpected noise arrested them. It was a distant rumbling from the northern part of the ice field, and it became louder and louder until it was almost deafening. Something dreadful was going on in the quarter from which it came, and Hobson fancied he felt the ice beneath his feet trembling which was certainly far from reassuring. "'The noise comes from the chain of icebergs,' exclaimed Long. "'What can be going on there?' Hobson did not answer, but feeling dreadfully anxious, he rushed towards the fort, dragging his companion after him. "'To the fort! To the fort!' he cried at last. "'The ice may have opened. We may be able to launch our boat on the sea.' And the two ran, as fast as ever they could, towards Fort Hope by the shortest way. A thousand conjectures crowded upon them. From what new phenomenon did the unexpected noise proceed? Did the sleeping inhabitants of the fort know what was going on? They must certainly have heard the noise, for, in vulgar language, it was loud enough to wake the dead. Hobson and Long crossed the two miles between them and Fort Hope in twenty minutes, but before they reached the encant they saw the men and women they had left asleep hurrying away in terrified disorder, uttering cries of despair. The carpenter McNabb, seeing the lieutenant, ran towards him with his little boy in his arms. "'Look, sir, look!' he cried, drawing his master towards a little hill, which rose a few yards behind the fort. Hobson obeyed, and saw that part of the ice wall, which, when he had left, was two or three miles off in the offing, had fallen upon the coast of the island." Cape Bathurst no longer existed. The mass of earth and sand of which it was composed had been swept away by the icebergs and scattered over the palisades. The principal house and all the buildings connected with it on the north were buried beneath the avalanche. Masses of ice were crowding upon each other, tumbling over with an awful crash, crushing everything beneath them. It was like an army of icebergs taking possession of the island." The boat, which had been built at the foot of the cape, was completely destroyed. The last hope of the unfortunate colonists was gone. As they stood, watching the awful scene, the buildings formerly occupied by the soldiers and women, and from which they had escaped in time, gave way beneath an immense block of ice which fell upon them. A cry of despair burst from the lips of the homeless outcasts. "'And the others, where are they?' cried the lieutenant, in heart-rending tones. "'There,' replied McNabb, pointing to the heap of sand, earth, and ice, beneath which the principal house had entirely disappeared. Yes, the illustrious lady traveller, Madge, Kalumaha, and Thomas Black, were buried beneath the avalanche, which had surprised them in their sleep. End of chapter 17